Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Life Skills for Teens. Um, my name is Christina, and I'm with Atlantic Institute, and this is our Life Skills for Teens class on um, how to do basic car and home care maintenance. All right, so um, first, I want to ask you guys, um, how, where, how familiar are you all with um, home and car care maintenance? Like, do you have a vehicle? So if you could let me know if you have a vehicle. That'd be great. Yes. Okay. No. I mean, you have a vehicle. And Sarah, do you have no. a vehicle? No. Okay. And then do either of you live on your own? No. Okay. Yes. So that was, I couldn't keep track of who lit up yellow. Okay. So I'm going to go over some basic things um, that I found very important that would be good to know um, based on some of my experience and based on um, what I found on YouTube also. So I did contact and reach out to the dad, how do I guy on YouTube to see if he could actually be with us. And uh, he wasn't able to, but I figured I would show his videos first. So the first thing I'm gonna do is um, share my screen and I'm gonna show, uh, I'm gonna do, let me know if the video pops up. It should, I'm gonna do basic car care maintenance first. Okay, so first Thank thing you, is gonna be, um, first be this. And so, hold up, hold up. Um, let me stop that for a second. Um, let me share again. Share sound. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right. Now you can see it, right? Yep. Okay. So we've got your whole screen, not just the video. I know it's it's got everything. Oh, I mean, you can see the video, and then you can see the YouTube here on the left, and you can see all the headers up here at the top. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, the importance of putting air in your tires and knowing, uh, you know, I always, when I walk out to my car, since I was, I've been a teenager and had my own vehicle, I've always just kind of, I don't always do a 360, but I always do like a quick look at it and make sure that they are inflated. Um, because you, if it's too underinflated, you can um, bust it. If it's too overinflated, you can pop it. All right. Heat expands, cold shrinks. So it, this happens when you're driving your vehicle. All right. Um, also, you get better fuel mileage if your tires are properly inflated. Um, so you'll get better fuel mileage if your tires are inflated properly. So the you also will wear your tires easier. Tires are not cheap. Tires are, tires are expensive. I just got two tires on my van last week, and that was about $300 for just two tires. And so you don't really want to do that often, and you want to buy a good quality tire. So I'm over here and I was like, how to put air in your tires. So I figured this was a great video. Good morning, Jake. Welcome to the Teen Life Skills class. How are you this morning? Like, I think Jake is with us. Jake, if you could do me a favor and just drop out of the chat where you're from, that would be great. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna play this and he's gonna show how we put air in our tires. Because I will tell you, I have actually taught some kids that were at the pump at the gas station, how to do this because they were pulled in and their tires were very low and they had to drive back home. They were on a college trip to go check out a college and they were on their phone with their mom and dad and they did not know how to do this. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna start off with this because not everybody understands it all. Sometimes things are so done that you don't ever pay attention. Or in your tires? To find out how much air you need, look at the side of your tire or the sticker on the inside of the driver's side door. So then when you're gonna put air in, you just put this on your valve stem and just put, press this handle. The most tire pumps will have a gauge here. It'll get you close, but it's not accurate. I'd recommend you get a digital tire gauge, okay? Cause that'll be accurate. Remove the cap and set it down in front of the tire so you don't lose it. First, you gotta turn on your tire gauge and make sure it's set to PSI. I just push it on. Okay, so it's telling me 32.5. I'm gonna go ahead and bring it up to 35.
now that we oh. have it where we want it. That part I thought was actually really important to know because not everybody, oh, I don't think. We'll just go ahead and put our cap back on. Knows how to let air out. You're good to go. Not everybody rides bicycles anymore. Oh, and he also said here, before putting your money in the machine, check all your okay, tires first. So today I'm going to show you how to put right, so air in your really tires. Important. Most of the to time, find out how much air you need, look at the quarters. side of your tire. Or um, it's an, it's uh, important to keep a couple of quarters inside your the sticker on the inside vehicle. Of okay, so um, the driver's side. A lot door. of times, what you want to do is keep a couple quarters in your vehicle. So that if you have to pull into a gas station and go to a one that has an air machine, some of them offer free air, some of them don't. Um, so you always want to have a couple of quarters to know what um, what you have. Oh, um, so, so you always want to have a couple of quarters in there. All right. So um, have uh, how many of you have put air in your tires? Or have you done it with your parents? I have. Okay. Sarah, have you put any air in tires before? Yes, but a lot of time the machine is broken. Oh, yes, I will say sometimes the air machines at some gas stations can be broken. Um, I have gone to tire stores. Actually, and I've had them help me put air in my tires before. Um, many years ago, we traveled up to Washington, D.C., and there actually was a tire place I could drive into. They hooked four, all four tires up, <laughs> and they, um, they hooked all four tires up, and they actually have a machine that read the pressure, and it repressurized everything, and it was, like, phenomenal. It was, like, the coolest thing I ever saw. So, um, all right, next thing, let me know. Um, can you see that tire? That um, that yep. video you should okay. Yeah, you should be able to see more as I go through. But sometimes Zoom screen share is kind of funky. All right, so how to jumpstart car? And I think we just did this with our teams outside. We have a mechanic shop here with a lot of vehicles, and so we just had them jumpstart a vehicle the other day just to practice it. So here, this would be a good video to watch on how to jumpstart a car. And I kind of like watching some of these because everybody has a different view and a different opinion actually on how to jumpstart a car. So um, I might stop it and share my different thought just so you guys know where there might be some differences if you haven't done this before. All right. You're uh, at the van trying to give it a shot to start and let's see. Sure enough, there's nothing. So we're gonna go uh, pop the hood and then I'll just show you what, what we look for next and how we, how we jump a car. All right, one quick thing to make sure you do is when you go to do that and you think your car is dead, make sure you turn everything off. Turn off the air, turn off the radio, make sure all the lights are off, make sure all the interior lights are off, make sure everything is off so nothing's draining on the battery. Sometimes you can hear a little a little something, but it doesn't turn over. And sometimes you can shut everything off and try to try it again. So you want to just sometimes you can try it for a second and play with it. But you want to make sure that before you jump it, you turn everything off in there. All right. Okay, so the first thing we want to look at, unless if, if you left your lights on and you know it's just your battery just needs to be charged, um, but if there was nothing that you, you weren't sure what exactly happened, then really you just want to look at the at the connections, right? So it could be because a lot of times if you don't pay attention to your engine, these connections can be horrible. Okay, um, mine are pretty clean, and I, I I'm pretty sure actually in my case my battery's just. All right, one other thing to make sure, see here, he's looking underneath the hood. The majority of the time, the battery's on the, on the on this side. Some vehicles, the battery's on the other side, and some, like I have a Chevy outside, and that battery is underneath the, the passenger, uh, the back seat in the passenger side. So batteries can be in different places, and some batteries, this is a top post battery. Some, ba so this has the negative and the positive. Some batteries can have a post on here and here, my daughter's car has one post here and you'll hear and it has like another post somewhere else like over here and you'll hear him talk about a ground connection so we've had to learn where that is too the it's life has just run out but as you can see my connections are good there's no corrosion here but a lot of times when you lift this up there'll be a lot of corrosion and that's what this tool's for okay it uh this cleans the post you just stick it on the post and twist it around and then this fits up inside that connector 
to clean that out. So that's one thing to look for. Okay. So now. Uh, oh, I've also had, um, I'm, I'm paused at the wrong spot. I've also had the whole entire battery cable be loose on my vehicle. One time I was at an appointment and I had to have a guy come out. I said, jiggle the, jiggle the cable. Cause I tightened it around there and it, it wasn't, it needed a different connection. So he jiggled it for a second and it started. So this, you don't want to do that. Um, but that was something that I had to do in the past. So you want to make sure that those connections on the, on the positive and negative are actually tight. They don't move. They don't rotate. You want to make sure you have a good set of jumper cables. Okay. That's where you start because you can, these are, these can be pretty cheap if you if you go too cheap on them. You just want to make sure you got a thick gauge. Make sure it's good. A lot of times those safety uh, those car safety kits they come with really cheap jumper cables. So I would say you might want to just put together your own kit and make sure you get a good set of jumper cables inside there. Okay. Okay. So we're at the dead battery, right? That's where we start. And an easy way to remember this is red dead. So we're going to connect the red to the red on the dead battery, okay? Um, but before you do, even do that, you wanna look for a place that you're gonna put the black one that's a ground. You would think it would go here, but that's actually what everybody's scared of because that can cause a spark when you actually connect that if you connected it to here. I used to do that. I have done that before. It's a little spark, but it was okay because I wasn't quite sure where else to connect it to because I didn't quite understand that whole ground thing. But I will tell you, just know if you have them connected on one vehicle and then you touch them, they touch together on another vehicle, they will, they can electrocute you and they can, they can do damage. They can spark quite a bit. So pay attention to see how he's making sure he's keeping himself safe from having anything spark. All right. When I was younger, I never had a problem, but just for safety reasons, we want to connect the black to a ground. Um, in newer vehicles, I think there's an obvious place where a ground is, but we, you want an unpainted uh, surface that is a ground. And to be honest with you, I, the, the best one I'm seeing is this, right? That little nut right there is a ground that I'm going to use, okay? So we're going to go ahead and connect. We'll just leave the black set off to the side. If you have a helper, this make, it makes it a little easier, but I'm trying to show you what it looks like doing it by yourself if you have to do it by yourself. So. Okay, so we want to set this off to the side and we want to connect the red to the dead. Okay, this battery's dead. There's really nothing going on. This is just sitting here. Okay, we're going to go over to the other car, the car with the good battery, and I'll show you what we do there. Okay, so now we're at the, the car with the good battery and we go ahead and connect those and we connect the red to the red terminal. Okay, and you can just put it right on, right on there. That's good. And make sure that this is clean too, right? So we're getting good connections. Make sure you get a good connection. So that's that. Okay, now we're gonna go back to the dead battery. Okay, so now we're back at the dead vehicle's battery. And like I said, you'd think you'd connect it there to the negative, but you're actually not because there can cause a spark. And if something, if there's some gases, it could cause, yeah. I mean, I, when I was younger, I, uh, I always did it that way, never had a problem. So odds are you'd be safe, but just for pure safety reasons, this is. Yep, I was muted. Um, I just want to bring up one thing before he goes further. There are a lot of newer cars out there. Most likely if you're, it's your first vehicle, or second or third, you might have an older vehicle like this that operates this way. If you are, if you have a dead battery and you need to jump your vehicle and you ask somebody for help, um, make sure they have a similar vehicle because I went to have somebody jump me one time and she had a newer hybrid vehicle that when you opened it up, it, it but did not look like his engine. It did not look like his vehicle. It was one that was battery and gas. And um, that was quite, you do not want, you want to pass on that because you can totally screw up their entire electrical system of their vehicle. So if somebody has a hybrid or, you know, like a, a newer vehicle that um, 
I was going to say battery operated vehicle, you you don't 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 even try to jump anything with them because you can totally screw that up. You can completely fry their vehicle. All right. This is the step that everybody's scared of. You want to connect this to that ground that we talked about. Okay, so right here, we're connecting it to that. Make sure you get a good connection. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the, the good car battery and start the engine. Okay, so we're back in the car with the good battery. We're just going to go ahead and start it up, okay? Okay, and so depending on how, uh, how dead that other battery is, you might need to let this run for a couple minutes. And you could even, especially if you're working with two people, uh you could they could rev the engine while you go ahead and try to start that other car okay and then also when you're in this car make sure everything's off no heater no uh radio nothing we just want to have it all the juice going to the to the dead uh batteries or the dead car's battery okay okay so we're back in the van the one with the dead battery and we're just going to go ahead and give it a shot that uh, the other car's been running for about a minute or two, and we're just going to go ahead and give it a shot. Okay. Oh, it didn't start the first time. Let's try it again. And if you remember in the beginning of the video, I was saying how you want to turn everything off. Because you can see when he goes to turn it on, the light, the overhead light up here turns on, the radio, everything over here turns on. That's also pulling extra battery juice. And you don't want that. So you do want to make sure that that's all turned off in that vehicle um, as much as possible. I was going to say, because sometimes those are just push power buttons that you really can't turn off when the battery is dead. But you can try to hurry up and turn it off as soon as the vehicle gets a little bit of juice to it. All right. There we go. It's running. Okay. So in my case, the I think my battery is just... Uh, uh, over its lifespan, they usually last, uh, it depends on the, the quality of the battery, anywhere from six to 12 years, really depends. Um, so I th Right, batteries today are cheaper made and they last at the most sometimes three years. So pay attention to that. If your vehicle starts dying before the cold weather comes, replace your battery because the cold is gonna suck that battery out of it um during the cold and it's not going to start and you're going to get stranded in the cold so if your vehicle starts like having some battery issues or some starting issues in like the fall time you need to go ahead and replace your battery uh, we get our batteries from o'reilly's here in um that's we get um they have very good batteries i know walmart does carry batteries but they're not the, the greatest um quality battery but um and many places will prorate your battery um, so if you have, um, if your battery has died before three years, if you bought a battery with a three-year warranty, let's say it died one year into it, then you're, the, they'll most likely exchange it out for another battery, right? The other thing just to know is sometimes your alternator and your battery work together. The battery starts and it kicks for the, so the alternator, sometimes if you're having issues, it's either the battery or the alternator. And sometimes you might have to replace them both at the same time. And a lot of times you can get a rebuilt alternator, which is much cheaper than a regular alternator. I think my battery is actually just dead um, and not gonna hold a charge. But um, what you would normally do, if you just left your lights on and you know that it was just that and that's why the battery was dead, now you would wanna drive around, you know, drive your vehicle for 10, 15 minutes and then, you know, don't go too far in case you have to, if, if you park somewhere, then you may need to jump again, right? So just be smart about that. Drive around for like 10 or 15 minutes, come back to where you have a good vehicle, and then, uh, and then you can go ahead and turn it off and see if it starts back up, okay? So now that this is running, um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to take the cables back off because you gotta do that now, right? Basically, all you're doing is doing it exactly the opposite of how we put them on. Okay, so let's go do that. Okay, so now we're just gonna remove everything just the opposite of we did before, okay? So you're gonna remove this. Okay, we took that off. 
And really, uh, you could just go ahead and remove this right now if you wanted to. The only tricky part is you just want to make sure that the, the ends don't touch. So just to be safe. We're right. This is the part I was telling you about. So this, if you were to have these, so these, these two right here, the positive and the negative are still connected to that vehicle. So these are live wires. So if they touch, they will spark and they will hurt and damage you. So I liked the way he did this here. We're just going to set this here and you just want to set it somewhere where it's not setting on anything metal. Again, if this is by, if you're doing it by yourself, if you're doing it with somebody else, it's pretty easy to do this, right? Because then you could just hold the cables, you could remove that, they just hold the cables apart while you remove the other ones. But just for safety, we're going to go back over to the other vehicle and remove those. Okay, so we're back at the good vehicle battery and we're just going to remove it. Like I said, just the exact opposite of we put things on, we're taking off the negative. Now nothing's going to spark, right? There's nothing, the two, just the two reds are connected, but then just remove that, okay? Now there's nothing, there's no spark because that thing's only connected to the red on the other side. So nothing to be scared of there. Okay, let's go back over to the other vehicle. Okay, so this is the last step. We're just pulling this red off of here, right? We want to remove that. And then actually I didn't put that other cap back on, on the positive. You always want to put that back on. And I'm going to stop it there because he's just going to go back over there and put that cap on. Um, all right. So any questions? Anybody have a question on um, jumping their vehicle or putting air in their tires before I move on to checking all your fluids? I figured I would check. And Carrie and uh, Jay-Z over there, if you guys could drop in the chat where you're from, that would be great. Kind of helps us to know where we are reaching our audience at, how far and wide we're reaching. All right, we already have uh, some from New Brunswick um, and from Baltimore. So, all right, any questions or anybody want to share any comments? Anybody um, have, oh, I got you. You're from Maryland. All right, so Carrie, if you could put in the chat where you're from, that'd be great. All right, so anybody have any questions or comments or have a thought when they've done this in the past and how it was? Um, I just wanted to check and see. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to the next video here and you should be able to see this. Um, my, uh, boyfriend here runs, we have actually a mechanic shop here. And so we do a fair amount of this stuff all the day as well as many other things that we do. Um, but I do want to make sure we go over this because many times vehicles are brought to us because somebody did not check the oil and it ran out of oil and it blew the engine or there was coolant fluid leaking out and the vent engine got hot and it blew the engine. So really simple things like checking your fluid, set a timer on your phone once a week, once every two weeks to go out and check the fluids in your vehicle, are really smart to do because um, you can make, my vehicle that I have has 254,000 miles on it and the engine's still perfect. We just took it all apart and resealed it and it's actually in perfect condition still because it's been maintained. So you can take any of these old vehicles and you can run them for a very long time if you keep their fluids done and if you keep them properly maintained. So it's really important. And we get people that come and go, oh, it was leaking some water out, so I put some water in. You don't wanna put water in. We're heading into winter time right now. So you want to not, you don't wanna have water in anything. He's gonna talk, he's gonna show you washer fluid, and he's going to show you antifreeze. So you want to actually make sure that this is winter time, that if you do have water in your windshield wiper fluid, that you drain it out or use it up and you replace it with windshield washer fluid. And if you have been putting water in your antifreeze, in your coolant system, that you take that out and you replace that with antifreeze. Because those, both of those fluids have chemicals in them that keep them from freezing and blowing up your system. We had a few last year that we had from in here in, in uh, Northeast Georgia, and we had freezing temperatures last year. We were below zero with the wind chill, and everybody was running around draining their tractors, draining everything that had water in it, bringing their vehicles over here so we could drain stuff and put antifreeze in it instead. So you want to make sure that you pay attention to that, right? So here, I'm going to go ahead and, and play this. Okay, first we need to actually open the hood, and that's usually somewhere right over here. It could be up underneath your dash somewhere along here but this one is right here and I just pop that 
Okay, so now once it's popped like this, there's a safety latch here and you just gotta feel around for the safety latch. I found that they're usually on the left side of the, the car. So you feel around for it and I can feel it right there. Sometimes if you can't find that, you can go up and down so with your hood a little bit and right you'll there. feel where it's and connected. So that's just a safety latch. So when you pop that, because you don't want your hood flying up, so it's a it's to you know it's a, a safety feature for you. And then so you just push that in and lift up your hood. And then my my uh, hood actually has this hydraulic lift that holds that for me. Sometimes you'll have a an arm that comes here that needs to lift up and and you need to secure it to keep your hood. All right, you want to pay attention. If you have one of these hydraulic lifts, they do break, they do fail. There have been plenty of people I have seen that have had a broomstick handle in their vehicle and they have propped their hood open with a broomstick handle because you want to watch these hydraulic lifts, make sure that they are holding if you have an older vehicle. Because the worst thing is when you when you pop this open and you stick your head under the hood to look at it and that hood latch comes down and hits on the back of the head. I've had that happen. It hurts. It's not fun. So, you know, a long piece of wood, broomstick handle, anything like that sometimes, or channel clips, um, pair of pliers that you can clip right here and it holds it open also helps. All right. It open, but this is how mine works. So, okay. So if you remember the, the term wash boats, That'll help you look around your engine and, and uh, look for the fluids that you need to look at, okay? So I'm gonna show each one of these as a close up at the end, but so we have wash boats, okay? So the wash stands for your washer fluid. That's, that's the fluid that goes in your uh, here for your windshield wipers. So when you turn your windshield wipers and you need that fluid to come out, that's what that is, okay? And then B stands for your brake fluid. And so, if you look around here, your brake fluid is right over here in my on my car. That's what this is. You need to take a uh, take a look at that. Okay, and then wash boats. So O stands for oil. Okay, and here's your engine oil. You need to check that. Okay, and then A stands for um, antifreeze. Okay, uh, so coolant right here. Um, it goes in here. It's also right here too, but you never want to ever open this when it's hot. Okay. So you actually want to add the coolant here in this particular car. So if you, if you pop your own hood and just kind of follow along and look at all these things. Okay. So A stands for antifreeze. T stands for transmission fluid. And in my, in this particular car, my transmission fluid is right here. And the way you check that is you turn your car on and then you check it. Okay. All right. So just so you know, like where he's pointing to here, his is transmission fluid. Some vehicles do not have this here. Some of them you actually have to get under the vehicle and find it because it's checked from under the underside. And most vehicles, you have to have the vehicle running to check the transmission fluid. Some vehicles might say this can be off, but most vehicles, the vehicle has to be running. And that can usually be found in the book and for the car. Okay, and then the last one of wash boats is S, which stands for your power steering fluid. And you, know, you gotta look around for it. My particular power steering fluid is right here. And you can see on the side whether it's full or not, okay? So I'm gonna get a close up of each of these and then we'll wrap up. All right, so here's the washer right the fluid for that goes in the for your windshield wiper you just open that up and you'd add some if you need if you needed it you'll be thankful that you check this if you're on a trip and you get mud thrown on your on your windshield you'll be thankful that you remember to check this okay all right say so it plugs it in perfect we'll start the car i need a tap to begin the scan now my two thousand dollars Okay, and this is my B, this is my brake fluid right here, okay? And I, you can see on the side, it'll tell you um, minimum and maximum. You wanna make sure that that has, uh, that's up to the, to the max. I like to try to keep it, don't go over, but you need that for your brake fluid, uh, for your brakes to work, because your brake, brakes work with hydraulics, and so that fluid needs to be, be there so that it can, so your brakes can work properly. I just want to tell you when you guys get familiar with your vehicle and its fluids, if your brake fluid is low, then you would know that somewhere you're leaking brake fluid. 
if your power steering is low, you would know somewhere you're leaking power steering fluid. Um, if your oil is low, you would know somewhere your engine is leaking some oil. All right. And if especially cool, your coolant level, if you're when you start, when if you've ever overheated a car, the smell of, of burning coolant, you will never forget. So um, if your coolant level is low, you know, there's a leak somewhere. So this is a really good way to stay on top of these leaks with preventative stuff. Then, you know, go to a mechanic, go tell them, hey, I'm leaking, I'm leaking something here or something here. It might be your power steering pump needs to be replaced. It might be um, the brake line needs to get fixed or your brake pad needs to be fixed or a caliper might be stuck or it, there might be something which is causing fluids to leak. Engine, you could be burn, burning some engine, some oil. And if you're an older car, you're, gonna, you're going to burn some oil, but um, you shouldn't be burning a ton. And so you wanna stay on top of your fluids. All right, because your fluids are literally the blood of your vehicle. All right, the O is stands for oil, and it's usually they're usually yellow, and then you just pull that out and check that. Okay, and this looks good. Um, I have a video on that. So I know there's a video on checking the oil, but I will tell you quickly, you want to always have a paper towel with you. You want to wipe that stick off, stick it back in, then pull it back out. And you want to let the vehicle have sat for a few minutes because all the oil inside the vehicle needs to go to the oil pan at the bottom, the majority of it, so that you know what level it's at. So you want to wipe that off and stick it back in and then pull it out. And then your second is the is your second time you pull out that oil dipstick is the um, accurate reading. Now, if you're ever as lucky as I have been, the top of your dipstick can break off. If that does happen and you can't reach that out, there are little tiny pick tools. I've had my the top of my dip, dipstick handle break off. And so we've had a little tiny pick tool that we've had to stick down in there and kind of one on each side and kind of pull that dipstick up. Um, if, if it breaks off, you don't want to push it down and further because you're gonna push it down into the oil pan and you can cause some damage to the vehicle having that down in there. You wanna go take that to a mechanic and you, I will tell you that on YouTube, there actually are hacks for how I, for drilling into it a little bit and putting in a screw in there and pulling it out. Um, there are a couple different hacks, but that has been known to happen on some older vehicles. So if your dipstick looks old, you need to go to an O'Reilly's or an Auto Advanced or an AutoZone or something like that and order a new dipstick because you don't want that breaking off. But anyway, this is just for quick reference to for things to look at, okay? That's the O. This is the coolant, keeps your engine cool. It flushes water um, and antifreeze through. So that's the A, it stands for antifreeze. Um, you wanna double check that and make sure that that has something in it too. Make sure that that is, uh, and just check the mark to see, to make sure that that um, has the proper amount of fluid in it. And then there's another spot, I'll show you that too. So this is also um, your coolant, okay? But you, you usually don't wanna to even touch this, just leave this closed and deal, use the other um, reservoir. That's what you, you wanna. Okay, so just a quick little hack. You don't ever touch this hot. I think you got that. That's why there's a huge warning thing on there. But my vehicle was having a coolant leak and we couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And what I would do, well, I, I could look at the reservoir over on the side and see where I was losing some, losing some, losing some every time I drove. But the best way for me to gauge was there still enough in the system was before I started the car while it was still cold, I'd open up this cap and it has a little thermostat in the top of it. I'd open up this cap and I would, look, as long as I could see fluid right below the cap, I knew that there was antifreeze running through there. Now, two things about antifreeze. One of them, it can be pre-mixed, which is a 50-50. And then there's another type of antifreeze for your, depending on what your vehicle needs. That is um, a full strength antifreeze and you mix that 50-50. So you mix half of it into another jug. So like if you ever run out of something on the side of the road and you have to go walk to the gas station, you wanna pay attention if you're getting antifreeze you know, does your vehicle, like, is it is the antifreeze you're buying pre-diluted 
or is it um, full strength? If it's pre-diluted, then you're going to want to, I mean, then it's fine to use the way it is. If it's full strength, then you're going to want to make sure you buy something else like a jug of water so that you can pour some of the water out and then pour some of the antifreeze in to mix it up. So it's just a good thing to know to be prepared for that and to look for that because they're not all the same. I have a Kia and so I actually go to the dealer and I specifically buy Kia antifreeze and I keep a jug of that in my back in my vehicle because each vehicle is kind of actually designed for a certain kind of antifreeze. You can go in and go get the Presto or you can go get the other kind from the store, but certain vehicles are actually kind of designed for their own antifreeze. It actually makes it function better. All right. To keep an eye on, okay? And you especially don't want to open this when it's hot. Okay, and you can look right here on my particular engine is this red, I think you can see that. That's my, it says AT oil, automatic transmission oil, okay? So that's something you want to check when the engine's running. You pull it out and check it while it's running, okay? And that's the T, the T in wash boats. Okay, and then this is the power steering fluid. It says it right on top of it, right? That, that's the uh, S in, uh, in boats, S, power steering, okay? And you look at that and you can see it on the side, whether it's full or not. If not, you just open that up and add a little. That usually is good for the life of a vehicle. So you shouldn't have to mess with that, but if your steering's tough or uh, something's wrong, you might want to take a look at that, and then you might have bigger problems, but at least that would give you a sense of what's going on. All right, so I hope that was helpful for you. To okay, any other questions before I move on to house stuff? Um, I did car stuff first because most likely before any of you live on your own, you will probably have a vehicle first. All right, so I want to um, just stress Power steering fluid, rarely do you ever open that up. Brake fluid, rarely do you even open that up. Um, transmission fluid, never really open that up. Um, my vehicle's got 254,000 miles and it still has the same transmission fluid that I got when I bought it at 120,000. Um, certain fluids, they're thicker than others. Like you have 5W20, 5W30, 10W30, different kinds of oils are designed for thickness and how cold it can get. So um, you wanna just kind of know your vehicle is not just take any oil at the oil store. It takes, and it normally takes five quarts, right? So, or some of them like my vehicle, I think takes eight. Um, so you, when you go to get oil, you're not just buying one quart, you're buying multiples. Um, and it's always good to keep one or two in the trunk of your car. I keep a antifreeze and I keep a one or two um, in the trunk of my car of oil. All right, but you want to know what kind of oil your vehicle takes. Okay, so that's, those are two very important things. All right, now I'm going to move on to some house maintenance things. I found these two videos from this guy, Clinton, that I thought were actually really good. Um, and they had a lot of really basic things. Some of them are a little bit more advanced, but um, some of them are things that you will deal with. And I'm going over some of these because I swear to you, I remember being 18 and my friend we went out to her car. She was, she had moved out of her house. She was renting a room in somebody's house and she um, went outside. We were going to go somewhere in her car and her, she called and her tire was flat and she called her dad and she said, well, it's, there's air on the top and it's flat on the bottom. And I went like, do you not know what a flat tire is? Like if you roll that tire, it's going to be flat all the way around. So I go over some of these things because I really want to make sure you know, because sometimes we forget as parents, we do a lot for our kids that they might not know where the hood latch is, or they might not know certain tasks that he's talking about here in this home maintenance stuff. You might not know it. And there's actually all these things are on everybody's to-do list. Sometimes the dad mm -hmm. primarily does all these things. Sometimes the mom does these things. Sometimes it's a single mom home and the mom has hired a handyman that has come and done these things during the year. And you have no clue and you're not aware. So sometimes I figure these things are important to go over. So there's two videos. We're going to go over them real quick. 
I know we're going to go over a little bit, but we didn't start till we were later. Um, so let me know if you have any questions. All right. So here we're going to list. We're going to start this now. Here are 20 common maintenance items that most homeowners forget, even me sometimes. Let's begin. Do you have a refrigerator that seems to run a lot or just doesn't cool very well? Let me show an easy way that can fix that. Now let's first remove away this bottom cover underneath the refrigerator. And if you look real close, you can see the coils that are currently underneath the refrigerator. I just recently cleaned these, but in a lot of cases, these right here will be so caked in dust, you can't even hardly see them. And this is what helps the refrigerator stay cool. So we need to get these cleaned out. And to clean up those coils, I strongly suggest getting your vacuum and sucking up as much of that dust as possible. Then get like a small air compressor and you want to blow out as much of that dust as possible. I've even used a leaf blower or something along those lines that you can really blow a bunch of air up in there. But just be prepared, you're going to create a ton of dust, so close off as many doors as possible and get your vacuum so you can help suck up all that dust and debris that you blow out. Okay, let me just tell you from the mom's perspective, pull your fridge out and clean behind it real quick before you do all that because anything that back there is just going to fly up in the air and you don't want that all over your kitchen. So my opinion would be pull out your fridge a little bit and vacuum behind it before you just blow it all into the air. Now almost every home has a fan. Now whether you use this or not, it collects dust. We have a tendency to use ours a lot, therefore it collects a lot of dust on the top of our blades. Now if you forget about this, you can easily offset the balance of the fan or it can just send dust flying in all directions when you turn it on. My wife has a good technique to help clean this. She takes an old pillowcase and she wraps it over each of the blades and takes both hands and carefully pulls off the dust, therefore catching almost all the dust in your bag you don't have to worry about it floating around in the air all right and i'm going to tell you my father loved to clean fans and he used to always use the extension and he used to use the tiny uh vacuum piece and he would go stand up on a chair and he would just vacuum up and down it's kind of a little satisfying if you like that asmr stuff that you see on face on youtube and he would just go up and down and he would just suck up all the dust and suck up inside sometimes too much dust that gets up there um can can actually um cross can actually mess up the electrical system now it's very important to know exactly where a hot water heater is in your house because as water comes into your house, it also brings in little particles of sediment that could easily start to fill up your tank. You don't want that to happen for a couple reasons. One, it won't heat your water efficiently, and two, it could cause this to prematurely fail. Now depending on the system you have, there are a few different ways to drain your tank. Definitely look up your brand and how it requires you to do it, but in my case, I just hook up a hose down here to this drain and I stretch it outside and I open the drain and it flows out that sediment and water and gets that cleaned out for me. Just be careful and check what you have before you do it. Otherwise, make sure you do this on a regular basis. Okay, so if you are going to rent an apartment or you're going to rent a house, you need to ask your landlord before you move in if they can go ahead and drain the water, hot water heater because those things will rack up your bill. Your electric bill is about one third of it as, as I've read in the past. About one third can be like your hot water heater in some cases. And I lived in an apartment one time. I woke up at like three in the morning, smelling like something was burning and I couldn't figure out what it was. And come to find out, I followed my nose and the little lingering smoke over to the hot water heater. And I had to shut off the breaker to the hot water heater to turn that off. But so much sediment had built up inside of that hot water heater. There's plates like electrical plates you know, like in your oven that are inside that hot water heater that that's what heats the water up. All right, when you have too much sediment in there, like the stuff, like sometimes um, calcium deposits, right? Because I've helped my father clean out the hot water heater before and I've done it in my house before. There's a bunch of white calcium deposits that come out because they settle on the on those, those heating elements. They get attracted to that heat. And that's what slows down the heat and the hot water in your room, in your house. All right, let's see. Sarah, wait a second, I'm sorry, 1201, you said what is on a regular basis? So expound for a second before um, I go back to the video. For which thing, which item that we're taking care of would be on a regular basis? The hot water tank. Ah, um, so a lot of times we go by, if it's not broken, don't fix it, because hot water tanks can be um, a pain to deal with. But I'm going to say like yearly, maybe, to every two years. 
one to every like every one or two years you you want to like it completely drains the tank and then sometimes you have to fill it up some and then it drains again um and just to clean out all of the sediment that builds up in there um where i live in north um northeast georgia we have clay dirt so our um well we have a well and so what comes out of our hot water heater is a lot of clay sediment so um that's what we, we've done we've, we've I've done it before it's and you want to make sure that that hose is good and connected you want to have a pan or a towel underneath there because usually they stick those in closets and you don't really want everything around it getting wet and you want to make sure you have a, a hose long enough that runs out side that and then you can inspect the water coming out so you can see how much sediment is in there but it does help to flush it like that about every year or every two years now if by chance you have any water filtration going on in your house for example i have a whole house filter right behind this pipe here a little bit hard to see but it's right here now i had just to give you an example um sarah how i was saying we have clay we have two of those we have one that stands like this right with a with a larger filter in it and then we have ones next to it with the microfiber filter so that's how much we have to filter out the sediment the clay in our in our water I have to keep an eye on this on a regular basis not only can this start to fill up with sediment and just prevent the house from just having water flow very easily but if i don't change this on a regular basis bacteria can start to grow in here and actually get us sick so if you have any water filtration whether it's for your whole house or maybe even just for your refrigerator it's a good idea to change it on a regular basis so you don't get sick. all right when we change this also we have a bucket we have underneath that because water is going to come out of here um so Sarah, you were saying if it's in a basement, um, it, it doesn't flow outside, correct? So mm, I had a basement when I lived in New York growing up and I do remember that we had windows. So I'm gonna say sometimes there might be, um, it drains into a five gallon, it's gonna come out kind of fast when you meet, right? And it will, you can drain up and into a five gallon um, container a five gallon bucket and you might need to have a sump pump in there that pumps it up and out or you might just have to do buckets i'd have to i will tell you smart answer even smarter answer would be go to your home improvement store and ask them how you drain it out from a basement because if you live see we don't have basements here but if you live in an area where there are basements they know how to do this they can tell you how but i would almost venture to say you might have to sump pump it up and out in a window um that's that'd be one of the things i would think of sick from it now almost every home has a washer and dryer but a dryer if not maintained properly can be very dangerous every time you go to dry something it's good to take the dryer vent out and remove any dust and lint that has built up in this but this does not catch everything on a regular basis you need to take your vacuum and create kind of like a, a an adapter or funnel whatever you want to call it maybe with like a paper towel roll or something something that you can get down inside here and vacuum out as much of that dust and debris as possible otherwise there's a good chance over time this will build up a bunch down in there overheat and possibly cause a fire. It's also very important to check your hose that comes from your dryer and going to your outside vent. The okay, so just so you know, my boyfriend is a firefighter and there was one house fire that they went to that the fire originated inside the dryer and the mom had already had cleaned this out before, but from where this connects to the front of the dryer where the lint tray is, is actually a long hose as well that she did not clean out. There's actually a, a, a large round tube that connects from where that lint tray is in the first first video to the back of the dryer to this, to where this connects to that. Um, and I think that the buildup might have actually happened inside the dryer like that. So what I just did even two weeks ago is I disconnected this from the wall and I got my wet dry vac and I stuck the, the tube for the wet dry vac down as far as I could into this um, to make sure it sucked out anything down this dryer hose. Um, I also do like every two weeks, we do actually vacuum the inside. We actually pull up a lint tray and I stick the adapter piece. I've done the, I've, I've tried the paper towel hack. 
paper towel roll hack and it didn't work. It just kind of sucked the paper towel shut. But I've used the adapter on the vacuum and I've put it down inside there and I've sucked up as much as I could. I um, have had to fix our dryer a couple of times. So when I have done that, I've taken the whole dryer apart in pieces and I have vacuumed out that tunnel hose that that runs between the back to the front. And there, I will say there actually was quite a bit of lint in there. But I felt like me taking this off and shoving the um, wet dry vac hose down as far as possible probably sucked out quite a bit of it um, when I did that like two weeks ago. These have a tendency to collect dust as well. And if you don't clean these out, these can also back up into your system and cause a fire as well. So they make little brushes you can go in here. I've even seen a friend take one of their leaf blowers, stick it in and blew all of it out. So in any case, make sure these stay clean. I almost think you could take a leaf blower and put it in the front where the lint tray is, take the lint tray out, put a leaf blower down in there and just and hit it on a few times and probably blow everything out of that. Um, might not be a bad idea to try. I'm not sure. Um, I want to just let you all know one other thing. Um, there was a house fire here a couple months ago. Um, oddly, strangely enough, where they, where it was originated from was they had gone to the laundromat. They had all their laundry. They shoved it all in their basket, brought it home and sat it in the corner near some newspaper, like piles that they had had. And the static from the laundry sitting in the basket, like actually static made a spark and it sparked the newspaper file pile on. And I was like, I never would have thought of that. And they said, yeah, actually they've seen it. You know, when you come back in from the laundromat, everything is super, super dry. And it's just all, you know, you kind of shove all your laundry in a bag or you, sh you know, cause you go to laundromat, you're gonna wash everything. And you shove everything in a bag. And when you do that, it just created a, it created a ton of static buildup and it sparked the house on fire. And I was like, holy cow, who would have thought? Yes, yeah, never operate your dryer when you're away from home. And that I honestly, since I've known of these couple of house fires from the dryer, I just don't anymore because I'm, I cannot have a firefighter's house burned down. That was not, that was not, I'm just like, nope, and I no, no, no. Now a lot of houses have these bathroom vents. They help get rid of the humidity and condensation really quickly. Now these are great when you're using them in the bathroom, but when you leave the bathroom, make sure you turn this off. I say this because a friend of ours nearly had their house burned down when theirs caught on fire. So a couple things to remember. Don't use these for extended periods of time, and you need to make sure that any kind of lint or any kind of debris that could build up on the, this cover right here or on the filter, those need to be cleaned on a regular basis as well, as well as the hose that leads to the outside. Now, if by like chance you have a standalone freezer, every time you open the door, condensation is going to start to build up on the shelves, and that's going to freeze. And the thicker and thicker that builds up, the less efficient your freezer is going to be, and therefore your food is not going to freeze as well as it should. So it's a good idea to defrost your freezer and get rid of all that ice. To do that, I would strongly suggest moving your freezer outdoors if possible, because it's going to create a lot of water on your floor. If for some reason you can't move it, then I strongly suggest putting out a bunch of towels inside and outside to catch as much of that water as possible. All right, and if you're like my mother, um, we had our deep freezer in the utility room in our house and there was no way any of us had the, the strength and ability and might to actually push that thing, first of all, empty out of all the food and push that thing all the way outside, outside the garage because uh, it just wasn't happening. Um, she put some towels down and then she took her butter knife and she just kind of like slowly chipped away at a lot of the ice in there. As long as you were, you know, and she took the shelves out and slowly just chipped away at some of the ice and broke some major pieces off. I mean, there's always that too. But it is good to do that because it does help it become more energy efficient and you can fit more food in if you have less ice. Now, if you have any equipment that requires fuel and it's going to sit for several months, let's say through the winter months, it's a good idea to make sure the last bit of fuel you put in it has some fuel stabilizer in it. This allows the fuel to stay good for a long period of time and not to start to clog up your fuel system. So anytime you're going to store equipment, make sure you put some fuel stabilizer in it. One other thing to know, if you have gas in a gas can, gas does not last as long as it used to because now they have ethanol in our gas. So that gets gummy after a while. That's why if you have a car that's not working, that's sitting outside, 
every week or two, you might want to like turn it on for a few minutes because you want to keep the fuel moving through it um, because gas gets gummy in a system. And it will, um, if you keep it sitting too long outside in a gas can, you can smell it. And there's a smell that it might have that it's, that it's, a ba it's bad gas and it's separated and it's gotten gummy and you don't want to use it. So nowadays, when you get gas in a can, remember this too, always follow the instructions because there's some people at the gas station. And I'm kind of paranoid about sparks and fires and flames that the gas can, I, taught, I teach my kids, the gas can goes on the ground. You keep your hand on it to ground yourself and you put your nozzle, your nozzle on, on the gas pump needs to touch the side of the can to help ground it so that there's no sparks. All you need at the gas station is one spark for the whole thing to go up in flames. So you just make sure everything's grounded. I always make sure I touch the car first. I'm not staticky. Like if it's winter time and you might get staticky, I always make sure I'm good. I'm not having any static on me. Um, I always make sure my hair's back because your hair can cause static, right? So I always make sure my hair's back. Um, I have one hand on my gas can and I have the other one is on the pump. And that pump, that metal nozzle is touching the, the side of the gas um, gas can because that helps ground it to make sure there's no sparking so it's just that's an awful like it's like if that's like 9b we'll just say now it's very important to clean out your gutters to make sure that you uh, get rid of all this dirt and debris that and leaves that have built up inside it but a lot of times people sometimes forget to actually clean out the drain it's a little bit hard to see but if you can look down in there you can see if you rent a house you want to ask the landlord Who's doing this job you or him i mean this should fall on the landlord to do some home some rentee renters like to do this stuff themselves but some landlords just expect think that you will so they didn't have a conversation with you on it but you want to ask this kind of thing because you don't want this root to the roof to rot while you're living there and you don't want them to say oh well it rotted because you didn't do this and there was a miscommunication on who actually was doing this job drain is fully clogged now depending on how your drain setup is done sometimes you can stick a stick down in here or maybe even just stick your hose down here and flush that out but in any case we need to make sure this entire drain system is fully cleaned out now we want to make sure that water is going to flow efficiently because if it doesn't it can easily back up and start to cause roof rot and once you get done cleaning your gutters, it's a good idea to make sure the water that's flowing out is flowing away from your house foundation. Because concrete likes to absorb water. And if you have a basement or a crawl space, there's a good chance if your water's running toward your house, that it will slowly seep through that concrete and get in that area and potentially start to mold or just destroy whatever else might be in there. Now, if by chance you have a fireplace that you use on a regular basis, it's a good idea to have it inspected during the off months. It's been inspected primarily for creosote. It's this black, almost tar type like substance that'll build up in your chimney and it alone can catch on fire causing major damage. So make sure you have it inspected. So like if you have a fireplace, yes, you do that. We have a wood stove, just like that was a wood stove in there. Our piping is all exposed. So we take our piping apart at all the elbows twice a year. We take it before season starts and midway through the season. So we do it twice through the year and we use our wet dry vac and we suck all of the creosote up and any um, other stuff. We suck it all up, we inspect all the hoses, all of the piping, and then we screw it all back together. So it's very important that you make sure because um, last year there was a fire, actually one of our family members, one of our long distant family members, they did a fire during last winter and their entire house burned down um, because there was too much in the piping and um, it caught on fire and it was in the middle of the night and it just it engulfed the whole house in flames. So Now when we're looking into sinks, right here on the end they usually have what they call an aerator. It's a good practice every so often take these out and see if it's clogged up by chance. And if you can see right there, there is a bunch of sediment built up in it. Right, you do this in the shower and you do this here. Um, and how you do this, because what the best thing is, before you do this is pour yourself a little bucket of water so that you can clean it in because you really don't want to turn the sink back on without the aerator on. It's just, it's just sometimes it's easier to have water set aside that you can wash this in. So we're gonna clean this out, put this back on and it should flow better. 
Now, if you have a house with a garage, it's a good habit to get into is to get some silicone spray or some white lithium grease and to go along all of your rollers and your joints and your sliding spots every so often just to make sure that it is nice and lube and it moves freely so it doesn't bind up whenever you need it. Also, keep an eye on your springs and your cable set up here. I've had them break and I've had them come loose. In either case, if they're not working properly, you can easily wear out your garage door opener. Now it's good practice to test your fire alarms on a monthly basis. In some cases, they are battery operated. In some cases, they're powered by the house with just a battery backup. In either case, make sure to check with the manufacturer suggests how often to replace that battery. Um, I was a foster home for many years, so we did that on the fifth day of every month. That was what we did. Or anytime I burned food, which might have been two or three more times throughout the month. So whenever the kids heard it, whoo, we had an automatic fire drill. So those are also very important to do. Also, make sure you check your fire extinguishers. These are need to be tested every so much. Just so you know, I have a small fire extinguisher in my car, just in case. Years Again, check with the manufacturer to make sure you know exactly when that needs to be done. Now, according to the heating and cooling of your house, in my case, I have an HVAC system or a heat pump. In many cases, you may just have an AC system, whatever it is. Lord, people, pay attention to this because I have been in apartments that that people did not know this and and I have seen some nasty nasty filters from people that just did not know because their parents did it all the time they didn't do it and if you rent an apartment um actually where I used to live one of the apartment complex that I lived once a month they actually came in and did this for me which was a blessing is, you need to make sure that you check the filter on a regular basis. Most places say 90 days. I like to at least glance at it probably once every one to two months just to look at it and make sure it hasn't clogged up. I say that because I was once at a friend's apartment and they didn't realize they were supposed to change this out. And when I looked at it, it was nearly a quarter inch thick of dust built up on it. I was surprised the system was even running. But after I got it nice and changed, the cleaner this is, the more efficient and less electricity you spend as well. When this starts getting yucky and filled of dirt and dust, your air conditioning bill goes up, just so you know. Cleaned up for them, it ran so much better and they were much happier. So make sure you check your filters. That's a good idea, probably on a monthly basis, to actually wash out the inside of your trash can. It'll help reduce any bacteria buildup and get rid of some of those smells. Also, if you use some baking soda and put that in the bottom of your trash can, it'll help absorb some of those smells and absorb any of those liquids that might fall to the bottom. I appreciated this hack on this thing only because I don't we don't do that. I don't know who does. It's probably a really good thing to do, but we only do that when something's leaked into the bottom of it. It is very important to know the condition of your roof because a very small hole can create some major water damage. So make sure to check it on a regular basis and especially after any major storms. If you happen to have a deck, it's good practice every one to two years to get out and just completely clean it off, usually with like a pressure washer. And then you want to go back with a nice, good, high quality sealer and seal off the entire unit. That'll help it last a lot longer out in the elements. Now, depending on the type of windows you have, most modern windows have what they call weep holes. These are basically little drains in the corners of the windows. So as rain falls and it hits the window, it will slowly roll down. Pay attention to this if you rent a house too, because I will tell you that sometimes if you haven't looked at these and make sure that those were there or not. Um, I did live in an apartment one time that they told us it was our responsibility to wipe the inside of the window frames down each month. Because if you've ever lived where it gets cold, there's condensation that gets on the inside of the window frames and mildew builds on that. And I had no clue that it was my job to wipe down the inside of my windows each month because um, I didn't know that that was part of part of the maintenance that I agreed to. So um, it's kind of important to pay attention to that in any renter's agreement or, or anything like that. And make sure that you look and see if those actually are there and go out these little holes, making sure to get that water back to the outside of the house. You need to make sure these stay clear, because if you don't, this water can back up inside the window and either rot out the inside of the house or around the window seal. I hope these ideas can make your home ownership even better. Okay, real quick. Yeah, Carrie, you said I line my metal garbage can with newspapers. It smells liquid, spills prior to putting in the plastic bag. Yes, we have... Um, we have, I don't have a metal garbage can, but we have a, where I live in the country, we have bags that we have to actually take our trash to the dump. And so we just have a 
plast a large plastic round um, trash can in here with the orange bag in it that gets taken in the dump. And so we have um, a couple of times I've kind of sprayed it down and wiped it down on the inside just because it gets it gets stinky. Um, but I didn't think about doing that on a regular basis because after you watch these 20 things, you think, holy cow, what am I get to like do? What else is there? And then, and then they come up with 20 more that people came in and said, oh, these are good too. And I, I'm going to show you all this just because it actually is kind of good um, to know this as well. And this was the last thing I was doing. Here are 20 more home maintenance tasks you don't want to forget. At least once or possibly twice a year, it's a good idea to go all the way around the outside of your foundation and throughout your crawl space because you want to check and make sure your foundation is nice and secure. Do some of that crawl space stuff when you know there's no spiders and, and snakes that are going to be hiding in there in the cold. Do that during the nicer weather when everything's going to be outside getting sun. No matter if it is concrete block like in this situation or poured concrete or brick or even stone. In any case, you want to look and make sure there are no separations in between the joints. Now if by chance there is a hairline crack in between it, you may want to just keep an eye on it checking back every week or month just to make sure it is not getting any larger. Now if it's any bit bigger than a hairline crack, you should probably get somebody out to check it and make sure you don't have a foundation issue in your house because any kind of foundation issue could easily shift all the Okay, uh, that's a bad stop. If you're renting, look for this when you're renting because I will tell you there are some landlords that will that will rent you a house and the foundation is shifting and they will still rent this house. You do not want this, okay? So just look for this when you're renting. Like make sure above this is a window or this is a door. Make sure there's nothing that looks like this. Structure of your house causing major damage. In any case, get it checked out. Now while you're in the process of checking the foundation of your house, you also want to keep a lookout for termites. Now it's really easy to spot them going up the side of your foundation. Usually it looks like a little mud trail, but it's actually not a trail. It is a mud tube that the termites travel through so they can keep nice and moist. Now if by chance you don't see any mud trails, keep an eye out for termite droppings. Yes, they'll be very, very small and almost look like a little bit of salt and pepper that's been shaken into a pile. Now, if by chance you see any evidence of termites, call a professional immediately. Termites can quickly destroy a home. Next up, we're heading into the attic. Now, the attic may be a spooky place to some people, but it really needs to be checked at least once or twice a year. You need to check for rodent or insect damage or infestations. You need to check for any kind of water damage or any kind of mold that might start to be growing. Also. When you do check this, you, you're not going to really want to make this a habit to go climb on, up into your attic. But when you go do these checks, um, it might be good to go to the pet, the uh, feed store, like here we have the feed store. Um, and you might want to get some bags with like rat poison or something in there so that if you're up there and you see anything, you can just throw that out there at that time. All right. Just so you've got a one stop trip. So check for ventilation. If you get up in your attic and it's extremely hot, then you're probably not getting the adequate ventilation that it needs. In any case, get up and check your attic. I will say we have a um, security system and we have lines running around and we have an issue with chipmunks. We get chipmunks up in the attic. So we have to go up there and inspect and put out poison, unfortunately, for them and also seal up any and all holes that they could try to be getting in at. So um, we've had them chew through the lines and short out all of our cameras inside. When fall arrives, especially before winter, make sure you go out and get all of your hoses and turn off all of your external spigots because you want to make sure that these do not freeze. Just okay, also remember that those external spigots, they sell things at the store. They're styrofoam with stuff that goes over the spigot and, it, and, it's, and you can pull on it and it seals it to the wall because it will still freeze like this because there's still some water in it. So you want it covered. You want the cold to hit the cover, not the spigot. Just a few years ago, I forgot and I left them outside and I busted a hose and cracked a spigot and had to get it replaced. In any case, make sure you get these inside before winter sets in. If you have an HVAC system, it's very important to go outside at least once a year and clean off your exterior coils. These can collect debris like leaves and other little fragments from trees and plants. You want to make sure to clean this off. A lot of times people will just use a hose and hose it off. That should work for the most part. If you have anything that's thick and gunked up on there, make sure you get it off but very carefully so you don't mess up any of the coils. 
Now on your HVAC system or just your plain air conditioned system, you should have a drain line that gets out the condensation that it collects. At least once a year, you need to go in and put a cleaner through the system to get any kind of gunk or buildup that might be in here. When I lived in Florida, our system had a hose. It went to this little box on the floor and then that box pumped it out and there would get all kinds of gunk between this and that. And I'd actually have to, un like this would not all be completely glued. I'd actually have to undo this and suck out the sludge and gunk. It was nasty, I don't know. Come to find out, I didn't know that those coils underneath the system hadn't been cleaned in years. And I went underneath there before I knew what it was. And I took a wet dry vac and I sucked all of the gunk off of those coils, which technically I think you should have a air conditioning professional do. All right, real quick, going back to the water. Um, Sarah was saying better to turn off the external water. It's inside. Um, sometimes you can turn off the external water inside. For us over here in Georgia, we have all of our external piping is covered in um, insulated, um, you know, the smaller looks like um, pool noodles, but they're smaller, it's gray. All of our all of our tube, all of our water hoses are covered in that for the winter. And all of our external stuff is covered in that or one of those covers are put on or it's wrapped in old pillowcases and taped shut, like lovely homesteading style. Um, and then, yeah, you've seen ads for fire blankets to use instead of an extinguisher. I, um, I don't know about that, but honestly, I'm going to get one of those um, to keep in the house because I think I'd rather use a, I've seen them and I've seen them and um, I've seen where those fire blankets do work good. So yeah, where you're at, it gets much, oh yeah, you're in Canada, right? Um, it probably must be done inside. So I'm sure there's some, I'm sure when they built those houses in Canada, there was a turn off inside for that. Here in Georgia, we don't have that. Um, and here we still have animals to feed outside. So we still need to use our water. Although I will say that when we know it's going to be absolutely freezing last year was the first year that it went like below zero um or in the in the in the tens usually it doesn't go below 30 um last, some we did actually fill up some five gallon buckets and we left them in the house to kind of like pull out to go water animals in the morning um so we have done that too all right here so it doesn't back up in your system and while we're on the HVAC system, the metal lines that are supposed to stay cool going into your house, these need to be insulated. This insulation has a tendency to deteriorate and animals can chew on it. In fact, I had to build this fence around our unit to keep our dog from chewing on those lines. I was a big fan of Alvin, Simon, and Theodore growing up, but now it's like waging war against chipmunks. So these things, they love to chew on all of these things. Thanks. Now, if you own a home, there's a very good chance you're going to have plants or shrubby around the foundation of your house. In those cases, you're going to have to trim these back about once a year. Now, I strongly suggest doing that in the wintertime or maybe at the end of winter when these plants are usually dormant. That way you can trim them back and it's less likely to hurt them. Now, if your bathroom sink drain is ever slow at letting water out, let me show you a quick way to fix it. And to do that, I'd suggest getting one of these little cleaners. This right here is just a piece of plastic that has a little teeth about one inch apart on each side. You carefully lower this down past the drain plug and then carefully pull this back out. And you'll pull out hair and gook and probably a bunch of stuff that you didn't even realize was down there. Okay, so this is a thing you wouldn't know about me, but I actually love doing that job. But I don't have one of those things. I go under the sink and I undo the stopper connector and I take out undo the p-trap which is that that circle that pipe that goes like this and i clean that out and then i pull out the top because if i've undone the stopper from the underside of the sink i can just pull that the the plug out you want to put something underneath there to keep it from going flush but i can pull that out and i can pull all the nasty crap with it because i try to have a rule in here with all of us with hair do not want do not brush your hair over the sink um, because all that hair goes down the drain and it gets stuck where the where the plunger meets the little there's a little there's a little bolt down there that the plunger meets and all this hair gets stuck right around it so I don't know how well that mechanism will work and I also um, take the drain out of the shower and I get all the the stuff out of the shower drain too because we have like three of us with long hair so let's see yeah the tub drain hard to clean 
Um, yeah. So um, you probably could use that on the tub drain. Um, I will tell you, I'm also in a handy women's group on Facebook, which is a really cool group to be in because they will tell you all the different things that you actually can try to access from the other side of a wall sometimes to actually get into those. Um, my grandmother's favorite thing all the time was baking soda and vinegar to help clear that stuff out. But um, my shower drain has two screws, so I just take those off. And then I usually take a, a, a flathead screwdriver and I stick it in there and I'm able to pull out all the, the huge hair clog. In the sink in the bathroom, there tends to be like toothpaste, hair, and just all that stuff that gets stuck down there. Um, I also have heard, and I've been trying it, and it does help, is once a week, boil some water and pour that down your drains because we get those little fruit flies and they tend to live in the, the, the pea trap water underneath the sinks. So I actually have been trying to do this and I find that there's less smell, like, you know, so I've, I've done the boiling water and I've poured it down the drains and I've noticed that it actually does help break up. Because a lot of times toothpaste and conditioner and shampoo, they don't break up, um, especially if the water gets too cool, they just solidify again. So that hot boiling water does help to move that stuff through. And I swear we're almost done. I now, most of us use vacuums to clean our house, especially if we have pets. You get the hair everywhere. We just got to get it up. But how often do you clean the vacuum? Now, depending on what type of vacuum you have, a lot of the newer brands will have these HIPAA filters in them. And if they, by chance they are washable, I do suggest washing them frequently. And if not, then replace them every six months to a year. And of course, check the roller on the bottom because there's a good chance it's going to collect hair and you need to remove that so it'll be more efficient. Important too. I use a scissor maker. Most homes have fans, but did you know you're supposed to change the up and down direction of flow depending on what time of year it is? In the summertime, you want the air to be flowing down. In the wintertime, you want the air to be blowing up. Now, there's usually a switch somewhere on the fan that you can swap that back and forth. And that just helps with the efficiency of hot and cold in your house. Now, it's good practice to check the seals around your doors and your windows to make sure it's keeping that hot air and cold air outside of your house. There are a few ways to do that. On a bright sunny day, make sure you turn the lights off for your room and check the seal between your door frame and your door just to make sure there's no light coming through. Then check the seal or it goes around your door. In my case here, it is rubber, so I'm just pushing on it, making sure it's still nice and spongy. Then I'm gonna close the door and make sure it has full contact. Then in the wintertime, I like to put my back of my hand along to where the door and the frame come together and move it up and down real slowly. And if by chance there is a crack, you'll feel that cold air hit you in the hand. Now, if you have any other suggestions about how to check the seals around your doors or windows, please put those in the comments so we can help everybody out. Now this next tip was suggested by a few viewers in our last home maintenance video. They said to go to all the knobs in your plumbing and just at least once a year, go to them, close them fully, and then open them back. And this will allow it to not only function, but you wanna make sure it is not stuck. So when you actually have a time that you might need, whether you're changing a filter, or maybe you have a plumbing situation and you need to turn off the water, you'll know they'll actually work. Real quick, I just want to tell you when I thought of it too is when we've changed the filters, we don't change them at night. Um, we change them during the day because if we end up turning off a bulb valve and pulling out the filter and doing anything with it and something doesn't fit back correctly or a pipe cracks or something happens, um, we would have to then be stuck with no water um, overnight. We can't fix it. And especially if there's any issues, if we do it in the morning or in the early afternoon, we can at least run to the hardware store if we need to and go get the supply we need and come back and fix it right away. Now, part of home ownership is knowing exactly where a circuit breaker is. Because over the years, there will be times you'll need to know exactly where these are so you can switch them on and switch them off. And after finding where your circuit breaker is, I strongly suggest labeling all of your circuits or at least having a piece of paper on the side showing what they're for. Now just before springtime arrives, you need to make sure that you sharpen the blades on your lawnmower so it not only cuts efficiently, it doesn't hurt your grass. Now I do this on a grinding wheel, but you could also use a file if you don't have one of those, but just keep in mind a file will take a long time. Now if you don't have any tools, some of the home maintenance stores will be happy to sharpen them for you. Now if you happen to have pets, I strongly suggest getting a UV black light. This is great just in case your loved ones happen to have an accident on the carpet. You can spot it and easily clean it up. Let me show you how it works. First, you want to turn off all the lights you can in your house. 
Then you want to turn on your UV light and work it back and forth across your carpet. And if there is anything, it'll be pretty easy to spot. And here's the same spot with the lights on. You can't even tell it's there. Just a heads up though, if you do buy one of these, there's a very good chance you're going to want to clean your entire house. Springtime, it's a great time to get outside, enjoy the weather, and watch the animals. But if you happen to see a lot of swarms of yellow jackets or hornets going anywhere near your house, you need to watch exactly where they're going. Because if they're going into the rafters or into the siding of your house, there's a very good chance there might be some nests buried deep inside your house. In those cases, you need to get a pest control out to take care of that. Now, if you want to see some crazy, huge, just disgusting nests, look up on YouTube, The Hornet King, and you'll probably be amazed. Also, keep a lookout for carpenter bees because they can easily destroy a wood project. With a lot of us working from home now, it's a good idea for us to take a little more care looking at our computers. First off, we need to blow off our keyboards for a couple reasons. One, we need to get any of that food fragments we might have been eating while we're working to get that out of there so the keys will all function appropriately. And we need to get that out so it doesn't create bacteria and make us sick. Probably a good idea too to take a wipe every so often and then just wipe everything down for the same reasons. Oh. Do you ever find yourself being able to relax on a couch? Maybe you're eating some chips or some popcorn, or there's a very good chance that some of those fragments are falling down into the cracks of your couch. So it's a good idea, at least once, if not twice a year, to pull the cushions up, vacuum all that stuff up so it doesn't make you sick. Here's a little bonus tip. You could always add some dryer sheets or maybe even some baking soda underneath of those cushions to help any kind of smells. If you have a basement like ours, there's a good chance you're going to have a bunch of storage just everywhere. Anytime you go down there, it's a good idea to check for any kind of moisture buildup. For example, you could have a leak from a pipe, you could have some foundation issues where water's getting through, or you could just have bad water runoff. In any case, you need to make sure you take care of those problems immediately. Just recently, I realized I had a leak, and I was able to discover that it was actually from one of our bathrooms. So I was able to take care of it quickly before it caused any major damage. So make sure you go down there and check it regularly. And if you have a lot of humidity down there, you can always get a dehumidifier to help. Now there Woo. All right, good job. We made it, we made it. I know that was a lot of stuff. It was a lot of stuff. And Carrie, you said you lay old winter jackets at the base of doors and hang from door knobs at night. Um, it keeps the cold out. I've um, always said, I was born in New York, and so we always had a, a, a long thing that went along the base of the door that kept the cold out. During the really cold time this this last winter, um, I actually um, got the, from the store the plastic for the for the windows that you put on, and then you you use that tape, a double sided tape, and then you use the blow dryer. And I actually did our air conditioning vent, um, the return, like he was showing in there. I actually did that as well. Another important thing for some of you to know: don't ever put anything in front of that. Um, air conditioning return you know like that big thing in a wall with all the little line that you know you don't I've seen people put furniture in front of it and I've seen people put a couch in front of it you don't um yeah do all that stuff might run out of time for anything else totally um I just to say that I've seen people put furniture in front of those things and it prevents the air conditioning from working correctly so you don't want to put furniture or anything in front of it um all right I know there was a lot of stuff, isn't it? When you come back, you're like, holy cow, that's a lot of stuff. But some of those things are just regular maintenance things that you do. All right. Thank you all for being with us. I know we've been on here a while. I know it was a lot of information. Um, it's the best way I could figure out to relay all that information. Anybody have any questions? Also, I will say what I did last year, some of those window doors that I did not use, I hung um, a big cur a big blanket in front of them and it kept the cold out too. Um, cause said, we're not going out that door right now. So we just put a big blanket across it, across it to keep the cold out. It's kind of good to have some old blankets around. Um, uh, anything else? Uh, great. It was great. Thank you. And I will tell you, I've also taken our feed bags and saved those like the dog feed bags cause they're plastic. Um, we have animals that are outside. And so I've taken those and I've cut them on the bottom and the side and I've opened them up and made um, my own kind of tarp with it or something that can kind of blanket a side of a, a rabbit pen or something like that. So, all right, very good. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.